Okay, so the microphone is on. Right. Okay, yeah, so very good uh, morning. I just checked the time. Uh, good morning to everybody. I'm Barry G for SJH. I think you have seen me many times uh, before. So, first of all, thanks to, to Graham and the organisers here at Marston uh, today, giving me some time to provide you an update with what's going on in relation to the 23 uh, centimetre band. Often the uh, questions are coming up on this more and more frequently uh, lately as, as the whole uh, discussion starts to, to, to hot up. So, um, as Graham said, I've been um, uh, working with our colleagues in the IARU since the uh, issue uh, kicked off. Um, they asked me with my uh, background experience that I had in uh, uh, the regulatory arenas of various types whether I would uh, support them with the uh, with, with leading the kind of uh, initiative that we have going forward on this topic and I foolishly agreed so uh, now I've been enamored with this for about uh, five years now and um, I'm hoping that it'll come to a conclusion soon I have to say <laughs> but we shall see so um, this is an update because uh, last year many of you were at the RAL roundtable and uh, I did give a much longer uh, presentation during that session where I talked a lot about the, uh, the detail of what had gone into the study, the technical study work that is supporting this item. And uh, we looked uh, briefly at uh, some of the measurement campaigns that a number of uh, bodies and uh, authorities and administrations had been doing and were uh, documented in the reports that are under development, the formal reports in both uh, CEPT and in the uh, ITU. So that took a lot of time actually and I don't really want to spend quite so much time as I have today on this so this is why um, it, it's a little bit of an update. Things don't move very fast so um, um, you know if there's only been a, 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 a small uh, a step shall I say in the process since I spoke with speaking to you back in June and let's see if I can work this. Is it going to be up or down? Yeah, there we go. Fantastic. So, um, yeah, you, you may be familiar with this this picture. Just to, to remind ourselves of the uh, of the situation, uh, here we are in our twenty three uh, centimeter band between uh, twelve forty and thirteen hundred megahertz, and uh, here are the various uh, subbands across the whole range that is uh, allocated to the radio navigation satellite service from down at eleven sixty four up to 1600. The various different systems sit in different parts of the band, whether they be a GPS system in yellow, GLONASS, which is the Russian system here in red, Galileo, um, who have really kind of been the, the, the party that have kicked this work off really, uh, in blue. You can see they operate also in a number of bands and, um, and they are spread yeah, right across the whole, whole range. But unfortunately for us, this is the focus of our attention here. Um, and as you know, it is a formal agenda item in the World Radio Conference, which is coming up. We'll see some more detail of that in a moment. Uh, CPT, which is the European body, is also studying, uh, studying this issue because it has its own work program to develop a European deliverable on the, on the issue. Um, the ITUR study program, uh, because it's a global body, includes consideration also of GLONASS, which is here in the band, which is the Russian Federation system, and also the Chinese system, and there is a Japanese system as well. We'll, look at, we'll see those in a little bit more detail in a moment. And the whole purpose is to consider technical and operational measures that may need to be applied to the amateur services in order to protect the radio navigation satellite services. <laughs> and we have a big page that I update as frequently as I can in the uh, IARU web pages, which, which you can get to here, where I update um, on a regular basis depending on what's been going on in these particular groups whether they be in Europe or within the uh, ITU. Um, so just in more detail, looking at the band 1240 to 1300, you've seen this picture before I think and uh, <coughs> actually I drew this uh, myself actually I have to give myself credit for this and uh, now it's in the formal report <laughs> so it's sort of become uh, famous. Uh, it's in the formal report and in the uh, text that will be going into the World Radio Conference, uh, actually. But the intention was just to, um, you know, really make it very clear what the issue is for 
for ourselves and for others here. I mean, you can see that these RSS systems, they occupy pretty much the whole band. There's only some small spaces where there's no uh, RNSS system active at the top of the band and, and in the middle here. Um, and, and these are our kind of nominally our band plans in a kind of general way uh, in the three regions, uh, region one, two, and three. So ourselves in region one, um, the Americas, and in Asia Pacific. Um, we have the best, most detailed band plan, and you can see you know, we, we've got a lot of activities that, that spread right across the band. All various types, wide bandwidth, medium bandwidth, narrow band, and so on. So this, this kind of scopes the problem and um, has, has set the, uh, um, you know, been the subject of the, uh, the, the studies. So what about where we are? Because, you know, as I sort of hinted at earlier, we've been talking about this issue for some time, and many years, you know, people have come up to me and said, what's happening on 23 Sams? I say, well, you know, not much so far, but uh, slowly, 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 the work is progressing. And that's the way it is in these, in these kind of groups. So I thought you might be interested just to, just to take a few moments to look at the path of where we are in terms of dealing with the, uh, uh, the problem. So it, it kind of kicked off really, you know, at the last World Radio Conference night in 2019. Actually a little bit before, because actually even before the World Radio Conference there was a discussion about what the agenda items uh, will be proposed for the WSR 23, which is at the other end. So everything is happening between this uh, beginning point here, WRC 19, and the end point here, which is WRC 23. And so this, uh, this World Radio Conference, they agreed to the agenda item, which had been proposed, uh, unfortunately. Um, and then this goes, uh, this is formalized in a resolution in the, uh, in the ITUR. The ITUR is a body of the United Nations, so it works through this process of having questions and resolutions. This is how work is done. Resolution 774. And this actually defines the, uh, the scope of the work. It's very, very important for this because scope is always something that's important to, to check and creates a lot of discussion if people try to propose anything that is seen to be moving outside the scope of the, uh, the work. And this is where the, uh, the WRC invites the ITUR study groups to, to carry out the studies. So it identifies the studies, scopes out the studies, and then in the next meeting, which happens like almost immediately afterwards, after the WSCO, there is a meeting called the Conference Proprietary Meeting. There are two of these, number one and number two. <laughs> and the first one looks at the outcome of the WRC and, and all the invitations to do studies, etc., etc., and identifies where the work will be done. So the conference preparatory meeting prepares a report for the World Radio Conference where, the, where all the agenda items that have been uh, proposed are, uh, formal, are, are entered into the report and along with their potential solutions and methods to, to, to resolve those agenda items. So, you know, the report is like one big input <coughs> into the World Radio Conference and it gives you information on what happened in all the studies and everything in between. So in this first meeting, they have a kind of a skeleton. It's all very formal in ITU. There's already a kind of, you know, a skeleton for the skeleton, shall I say. So they develop the skeleton report. They identify the rapporteurs for all the projects. They identify which study groups will be responsible providing the, the, the study work, the technical work that will go into the, into the report and so on. So in that CPM1, for our particular uh, issue here, 9.1b, agenda item 9.1b, it identified study group 5, working party 5a, as the responsible group. So in working party 5a, uh, there is uh, a working group, 5a1, that um, deals with the amateur, all the amateur issues actually. Um, so it made sense for that uh, topic to go into that area. But in study group 4, which is the study group that, uh, that uh, accommodates the, the, the satellite industries of all sorts. This is where the radio navigation satellite service people sit. So they have a working party 4C, and within working party 4C they deal with any issues relating to the radio navigation satellite service. So they are what you might call the expert groups, you would say, on the radio navigation satellite systems. So, they, so whilst working group 5A had the responsibility for creating the input for the report, the CPM report, 
Um, study Group 4C was a contributing group and provided the, uh, uh, the necessary information on the radio navigation satellite systems. And in fact, there is a close interaction, as you can imagine, between the two groups, because actually this group provided the information on the amateur services, which we, IAOU, mainly provided by contribution into 5A, uh, and then 4C does the studies, and then 4C sends back the results of the studies to 5A. That's the theory. Actually, there's a lot of, you know, backwards and forwards uh, in, in this little arrow, actually, that happens in, in, in reality. So ultimately, uh, by around, I think it was middle of last year, Working Party 4C completed its studies, and there is a report that is published, 2513, uh, where the, uh, the study methodology and the actual calculations and everything are detailed. Um, in 5A, there are two deliverables underway. There's a thing called, these, these are kind of interim names. They have, uh, before they're published and get a number, they have a kind of working name, working title, if you like. Report AM characteristics, amateur characteristics, are the um, uh, information that we provided to the, uh, to the ITU on uh, what sort of applications we have in the band, what kind of technical uh, operational uh, aspects we, we use in the amateur services, so what kind of antennas we use, what kind of power levels, how many stations are active, all this kind of stuff was included as, as data for, um, for the 4C uh, studies and is detailed in this report, which is still draft at the moment, amateur characteristics. And then there is another deliverable, which is becoming more important at the moment, called amateur guidance. And this is where we're seeing the uh, proposals being made to you know, provide or bring into place some constraints on the, on the amateur uh, service. So Working Body 5A fed text to the CPM report at around about, um, I think not after the last meeting, meeting before, so around June, I think last year, if I remember rightly now. So that's already kind of gone ahead. Uh, and then the CPM2 meeting met actually about two weeks ago, um, and they finalised the report, uh, which is now will, will now go forward to the WRC. It'll take some time before that's available because it has to be translated into all the languages in the ITU uh, and so on and so forth. So, but it will eventually be available for the WRC. So this is the long kind of formal process that the whole thing is going through, which is why when you say to me three weeks later, oh, what's happening on 23 cents? I say, well, much the same, really. Nothing much has really moved. But, you know, it has moved along in these study groups here, because this is where we've been active, the studies in, in, the, in the RSS group, and we've been working party 5A, reacting to those to develop the, the guidance that we think will form the basis of the solution for this uh, uh, gender item. So yeah, very slow, you know, the whole study period goes all through 2020, 21, 22, and still continues even now. And even in actual fact, this, this activity here in the study groups could continue even beyond WRC. So the WRC activity kind of comes out of the study group process. So, you know, there could even be some development, I don't know what at the moment, or even if it is likely to happen, that could mean that this work somehow continues into the future. I really hope not, but uh, <laughs> we'll see. Barry, excuse me. Just can you just could you just identify CEPT on there for me? Uh, CEPT is not on the chart because this is ITR. Yeah. So CEPT provides uh, is, is a regional telecoms organisation. Feeds into uh, that feeds into uh, the ITR work. They can uh, provide their own contributions to uh, ITR and the countries in the CPT as countries can provide uh, inputs to the work in, in, in ITR. So they're not in this slide because it's not a CPT activity, it's running in parallel. I understand, but do, do for example, Working Party 5A take note of what CPT is doing or is it? If CPT provides a contribution to, to Working Party 5A, then yes, of course, it will take it into account. If CPT wants to make a contribution, then it has to be agreed by the CPT countries. Quite often, you know, not all the countries in CPT, or 47 of them, would agree uh, on the detail of a, of a contribution from CPT, in which case then they can make like a multi-country or individual country. I mean, any member of ITR, uh, administrations can make a contribution into the study groups, including ourselves as observer organisations in, in ITR. All, all contributions 
are, uh, are possible within RTR from all those different bodies. So it's not just, let's say, the regulators, but uh, you know, industry or non-administrative you know, um, parties can, can participate in the, in the, in the work. Thank, thank you. So CPT, obviously, obviously it's a little tricky because the same countries are involved, but it can run its own track. And I haven't really um, uh, uh, dealt with that here because ultimately it's really what happens in this WRC that's yeah, really going to set, set the tone even in CPT and other parts of the world. Thank you. There's a thing on my screen. There's no update to install right here. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, that's the process in... in it's kind of summary, and it won't do it because it might be later. Very good. That's it, Mr. That's it. Lunch time. <laughs> what happened now? I know regulatory stuff's not exciting, but you know, I need to pull my car out. But it concerns the final 23 seconds. Right. Yeah, it actually came up with a, yeah. wanted a Java update. Oh, so, so yeah, so I had to use it. Why am I just jumping ahead to my. Ah, these I've got hidden stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, something that I've been following it for some reason. Yeah, I don't know what it is. So um, what, I, what I wanted to do, so that was the process, you know, not very exciting, but it gives you a kind of a flavour of how slowly it sort of moves forward, but it's a bit like a, you know, a super tanker, you can't kind of stop it, so um, that's the process. But as I said, the, one of the deliverables there from Solid Group A is this thing called the guidance, recommendation guidance. Uh, it's a draft ITU recommendation. And the intention is that it will provide, and this is kind of the, the way forward that's been kind of agreed in the, in the study groups, it will be provide the guidance to any administration who feels that they uh, have the need to protect the radio navigation satellite <coughs> service. And there will be some who will believe they have to do this, um, maybe others who, who don't. And... Um, this, this is a small part of the document. I don't want to show the whole document because it's like a draft report. It has different colours of text. It has blocks of colours. All sorts of proposals from all sorts of other parties are <coughs> all still in the document. But here are some figures, um, again, famously drawn by myself, I have to say, in the study group, um, to try and help resolve the discussion that we're having and is, that is still active and is still unresolved in the study group on, on the ban. Now, the original uh, proposals that came into the recommendation uh, dealt with narrowband and broadband applications and they had separate <coughs> annexes for narrowband applications, let's say like voice and, and, and so on, uh, another annex for broadband applications like DATV and um, another one for the amateur satellite service which is also within the scope of this uh, uh, activity as well and it's pretty hard to really you know kind of and it's all in text right so it's really hard to get a picture of what was what so I, I, I drew this thing these things here there's two now um, to help try and resolve the, uh, the situation so both of these are currently still in the document but I'll look at one of them which is this one um, with a few uh, notes and things on it to help you understand the direction that we're trying to take uh, with this work. So what we decided in the IRU is we don't like, and nor does the ITU like, uh, instructions that tell you to discourage activities. They like to encourage rather than discourage things. So after a little bit of discussion, we decided to try and take this approach of identifying preferred frequencies within the band <coughs> for the amateur service to operate. So this is our uh, you know, whole band, 1240 to, to 1300. And we identified uh, in that range certain preferred frequencies 
for uh, both narrowband uh, applications, voice, narrowband data like we have today, and for broadband applications like TV and maybe some other data uh, activities as well, and for the, the satellite uplink. Um, <coughs> and those are kind of what is illustrated here. We have block A, block A, this is a kind of special case we'll come to that in a minute, uh, block B, and uh, oh, block C. This is what this one is actually. Just change your hands here. Um, so broadly speaking, block A would be is proposed for narrowband applications. So at the moment, you know, pretty much we use 1296 or 1298, right, today, for our most of our narrowband applications. So we've proposed that that continues. Um, and we've proposed a power level, which is not agreed yet, of, a, of 150 watts. Now, you know, some people think we're giving away the crown jewels here and everything in these proposals, but we have to make a kind of a judgment about what we think might be, you know, acceptable. Um, if we come in with some kind of, um, you know, very high power level, it's, it's clear that the studies will, will show that this, or show that this is not be uh, uh, really possible for the radio navigation satellite service receivers. So we have to try and find the compromise. So um, we, we've, we've, we're trying this, this figure of 150. Now, interestingly, we, we also uh, proposed 1298 to 1300 as, as part of block A, and 100 watt, 150 watt power level. And uh, France said, yeah, fine. We said, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we were quite surprised, I have to say, that there were this, this seemed to be sort of acceptable at the last meeting. So this, this, this is the only part that's really kind of agreed uh, in any oh, way right. at the moment. And in actual fact, even then, it's still, in, it's still not fully agreed because the document is still open and anything could happen. I think, John, you were going to... Yeah. On one point, you've got EIRP written down for the 1 to 10 watts in block A, but all yeah. the other 150 watts has not got EIRP against it. Correct. Is that 100 watts transmitter output there? Correct. So you could, Doesn't you say EIRP. Pardon? You can put your dish on the end of that. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that's fine. So, I just wanted to clear it up. All the fruit and whatever you use as an antenna. John? See, see, actually, my question is, why is that block A so wide? Because, because if, it, if it was only 1296 to 1296.5, <laughs> that would easily cover all the narrowband activity ever on that band. Well, I, I understand that, but I, I don't, I'm not sure that's necessarily the case. What we, what we tried to... Sorry, I should have yeah, that okay. power level. If you look into the band, I mean, all our, we have a lot of activities. Most of our activities are in this range, I agree, right? Mm. Um, but, you know, we're trying to take a, a broader brush kind of look. I we're mean, not, we're not doing a band no, plan. Great, we're not doing a band plan here for the amateur no. services. That would be something that would happen right. subsequently, right? When we reorganise what we do, maybe, depending on how this resolves itself at the end of the day. So we're just trying to identify, you know, blocks where narrowband operation, narrowband signals would be, you know... Um, but the RNSS community would happily uh, accept that those could operate in that part of the band mm -hmm. at, at that power level. And, you know, we try and time and time again to say, look, even though we have a 150 watts proposed as a kind of a figure here, not everybody is operating at 150 watts. You know, we don't sort of come in and switch on a transmitter that transmits 24 hours away <coughs> at 150 watts, right? This is, this is something that is, is, is quite difficult, actually, sometimes to, 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 to get over. But anyway, that's our proposal. There is also a counter proposal here from another party, which was 100 watts per megahertz. Proposed, we don't like uh, the spectral density approach here, I have to say, because we think it has lots of confusion around how it's measured and how it's understood. So we, we, we're, we're, we're speaking against this kind of uh, proposal, but it's still in the document. So uh, block B down here uh, is proposed for the broadband applications. This is principally uh, digital amateur TV. Um, we propose four megahertz here from 1254 to 1258 in, in the kind of this sort of middle area between these two systems here. Now we know from the studies that actually the most sensitive part for, for the Galileo system is to have a broadband uh, emissions, wideband emissions in the middle of their passband, as you could imagine, right? I've got to ask you, Barry, sorry. Um, L band and, and the spectrum defined as E6 is quite well populated with primary radar. So is work being done to mitigate the effects of that or are they just going after a soft target? So so 
radar is already in the band, radio location services are already a primary service in the band. Yeah. So radio navigation satellite services are also a primary service in the band. So they have to live with the with the previously allocated relocation. So they have they tell us they have mitigation that allows their system to operate in the presence of uh, a radio location system. Okay. So that's but that's not that's not part of the study. No, no. That's outside the scope. It's it's already the the, the, the framework is already understood to us. I mean we're already also already we're a secondary service in the band, which is why we have to not cause interference to Radio navigation satellite service or the radio location actually, which is why we coordinate our uh, TV systems with the uh, Civil Aviation Authority in the UK, for example. I'm just curious how they mitigate the effects because the ERP, ELRP, of some of the radar yeah. sources. You may, you may well wonder. You're not the only person to wonder. <laughs> okay? But it doesn't change really how this, how this goes. So, Block B. Yeah. Block B we've identified as, as somewhere for broadband uh, applications. Again, we proposed uh, 100 watts. This is not agreed at the minute, but it's still on the table, as is this spectral density figure. Uh, there are some other difficulties here because the dotted lines show where other uh, proponents have made proposals here. In particular, uh, I think the Chinese, I think it was, because they operate the compass system, or Beidou it is called, uh, in some uh, uh, quarters, they, they, they proposed just this space here. And we said, well, but that's not even a viable, you know, it's not a viable piece of spectrum for the amateur services to continue their application there. So that, that's still open for, for discussion. Um, in, in document 661, which is actually a Russian Federation proposal, uh, and Block B didn't exist at all in the Russian Federation uh, proposal, so they uh, don't have any. Uh, area for broadband applications because they have their GLONASS system here. Um, so these kind of elements are still open. So, but you know they're all still on the table, and I think we have a fair chance of at least something you know being agreed at the end of the day. Because people, some people do understand that for the amateur services we still do need to have some utility out of our band, right? Um, even if we have to protect these other systems. So for the amateur satellite uh, service, which is block C, then they're proposing uh, a 2 megahertz uh, block here. Uh, also 1260, oh, what actually was the bottom? 1260 to 1270 is the band. So 1260 to 1262 has also been proposed as well. The idea is that basically we move it, we keep away from the center of the, <coughs> the Galileo system here. But you know, the reality is there are not really that many uh, amateur satellite systems operational in this band. Um, it's uh, space to uh, space to um, earth to space. Yeah, uplink. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It's uplink band, um, and, and, and there really isn't that much operation. And most of the, the traffic that's involved there is sort of telemetry or data traffic, something like that, rather than voice traffic. We found. <coughs> anyway, there is an allocation, so we still have to deal with that. This block A bis is a kind of strange thing. Uh, actually, this came pretty much from uh, Germany, I have to say. And it's been proposed because if we have just block A and block B, and they get agreed, then we immediately write off all those uh, nice voice repeaters that we have uh, in the band. And there are some people who have an interest in this. I know people have varying interests in different uh, things. So we've tried to um, suggest this, this block here with a very restricted set of um, applications, basically uh, for, for narrowband uplink only and repeater system um, so that there is still some way hopefully that those systems might be able to operate in the band okay they might have to adjust something um, but that's what this proposal is about that's why it's a low power as the Dennis uh, identified there and, and, and a sort of EIRP has been uh, uh, proposed as a, as a way forward to, to, to regulate that it's caused a lot of discussion, I have to say. Um, some people want to move it a little bit more to the to the right. You know, that brings challenges, so we're discussing that. And to just to say another comment on this 1296 to 1298 part, well, the reason why we're still trying to uh, push for this is because, um, you know, if we do move everything into this two megahertz here that's been agreed rather than sort of band, then, then clearly everyone would have to do something to their equipment. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, if you've got a nice IC, whatever, I'm not a black box guy, so I don't know the number, 9700 is it? Yeah. yeah. 
then okay, maybe you just turn the knob, right? So that's fine. And, and maybe with a few other commercial transceivers. But if you've got a transverter system or something like that, then you might have to reprogram. Uh, you know, you may or may not be able to do that. You know, there are issues around just moving our, our sort of center of operation by, by two megahertz up here. So we're trying to avoid that if we can. Um, so we'll see how that goes. The important thing is, you know, to stress, again, none of this is finalized yet. But, you know, hopefully I, I can give you a sense of the, the direction of travel with what we've tried to, to propose. So in these areas here, beneath, between these blocks, effectively um, transmission in those parts of the spectrum would be, well, I'll use the word discouraged, um, but they might either, by putting a very low power limit, and there's been a figure of five milliwatts proposed, which is you know, not even mixer output level, right? Um, but basically what they're saying is that we, we, you know, we prefer not to have any emissions in these parts of the of the band. There are some other, other interesting uh, things as well, because actually in, in CPT, Peter mentioned CPT, actually the CPT work is only worried about Galileo, <laughs> right? Down to 1260, actually. So maybe in CPT, I don't know, there may be some, they, they may decide that they might not need to adopt everything that's in ITUR. I don't know, it's hard to predict how that'll go at the minute. I don't know. Harry, how do you interpret the 100 watts <laughs> per megahertz? How, how do you personally think it will, would be interpreted if, if implemented? Well, I, I would imagine, so okay, so if you've got a 1 megahertz wide signal, you could have 100 megahertz of, of power. If you've got anything, if you've got a, a, a 2 megahertz signal, then you could have 200 watts of power. But if you were below 1 megahertz, <laughs> How, how do you interpret that? that be me. Yeah, this is why I say it can be confusing about how that is interpreted because actually if you measure a 10 kilohertz by signal in a 1 megahertz bandwidth, then you've got to respect 100 watts, right? Yeah. But if you say, well, actually it's, it's 10 kilohertz, so I've got, uh, you know, uh, 20 dBs more, um, so I can have uh, a kilowatt or whatever the figure is, then I think that's kind of not quite right. So you can easily, you can see there's a kind of misinterpretation. And, and actually, we don't actually like EIRP either, because EIRP means that somehow you're regulating the antenna, and, and that can cause difficulties. You know, how do administrations know what the gain of your, your antenna is? Can you explain <laughs> sure. some administrations have already put a limit on some of the countries? Sorry, Dennis, say again. Some of the other countries have got a 10 watt limit, do you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, administrations can do what they like, right? So um, they've, they've decided, I think you're talking about Austria, right? Yeah. Where we've seen that they've proposed 10 watts across the whole band, which, which is really, I think, a bit unfortunate because, you know, they've moved ahead of the, of, of the work in, in both CPT and in ITUR. Um, I don't know on what basis they've, they've, they've agreed that. I mean, we have to try and find out. Once it's decided on that we do get all of this, they can give it back, I suppose. Well, I think that what I don't like about that is, is what I'm uncomfortable about is it, it kind of sets a precedent, you yeah, know, because in, in CEPT, <laughs> what will happen is, you know, they'll put their hand out and say, well, actually, in Austria, we've uh, decided this, so, uh, you know, this seems the best way forward, because administrations don't want complicated things. Yeah, That's no. the problem. They want a simple answer, right, that they can, they can deal with. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit unfortunate that, that, that they've done that. Um, of course, maybe in the future they could they could change it, but I, I do say often people point this out to me. But but actually in Austria they they've given them a whole host of uh, new conditions across all their bands, including more power on some bands like 10 gigahertz and and and, and some of the HF bands. So you know from their perspective, the perspective of the administration, they've given a lot of uh, new um, opportunities for the amateur service even if they've made a limit in this one small band. So if you take it out of context, you know, if you sit in there from their perspective, you can get a different picture of it. Um, yeah, what's next? Time's running out. So I just wanted to touch on something we've been doing. I'll very quickly I'll do this, because we're still in discussion, as I said. And, you know, technically it's very challenging to, to, to win the arguments about, um, you know, having high power and all this kind of thing in the band. But one of the things we feel has been largely um, not dealt with fully, I won't say ignored, but not dealt with fully, is, is really the information that we have about 
how much we really use the band. Now I know this is kind of between a rock and a hard place because if you don't say you, you make much use of it, then they say, well, oh, but take it away. But we're not in that game because that's outside the scope of the discussion anyway, thankfully. Um, but you know, we, we've looked at data and we provided data 5A that says, generally speaking, if, even if you add up all the sort of activity periods and things where we're really most active and we really have stuff going on the band, it only amounts to something like about two or three percent of time throughout a year. So that means there's only about two or three percent of time in a year when there's likely to be any density, shall I say, of amateur stations on the band. And then if you look at the numbers, I looked at a lot of data from like the UK ACs and other places to try and get a feel for the numbers of stations which are, are really active in any one session. And, and you can see that, uh, you know, the density, so if you then interpret that into a density of stations for use in studies, it's actually quite low. So we, we've done this uh, uh, simulation, you know, our colleagues in the IARU, uh, where we've done what's called a kind of Monte Carlo study. This is a kind of statistical approach where you, you constantly place um, uh, victim receivers, which, wrong button, which in this case are these little triangles here in an area. These are, represent the RNSS receivers in moving vehicles. And we have an area here, this is just one example, there's, there's many examples of this in the report actually, uh, which, which represents the area around of a typical density around an amateur station who's emitting in this direction and he's operating I think at 100 watts or so and then you, you constantly move these vehicles and you assess every, every time you move them you assess what the interference level is that they're receiving and then you build up a kind of picture of, of how many of them are suffering interference above a certain threshold that is deemed to be harmful and that's detailed in the RTI reports and these are the kind of figures so, you know, in a minimum density of amateur stations, so maybe like uh, IO 82 squares, say, maybe, um, you know, 0.02% of those mobile receivers are, are impacted. That's very, very small, right? If you take an average density, um, uh, maybe, maybe IO 82 is a bit unfair, maybe it should be uh, I don't know, IO 70 or something. Maybe this is IO82, you know, still less than one, less than 0.1%. And even then when you have maximum density, so this is IO91 square. <laughs> right? On a Tuesday night once a month. Exactly, that's what the 2% two percent, two percent figure. Exactly, no, you're right, you're right. It's true. You know, half a percent of, of these, 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 these receivers in, in within that area around the station, if you, I mean, okay, I know in reality you haven't got a homogenous pattern of, of amateur stations, but you have to somehow simulate it. Very small. So, so for two percent of time in a year, there's a half a percent of all the RSS users could be impacted. This is tiny, mm -hmm. but this is forgotten. This is not so well how treated. That, how well, it's not forgotten. It's just not known, is it? Hmm? It's just not known by the sort of people who do this sort of thing, is it? Well, I think they choose to uh, ignore it, really, because it doesn't fit the narrative. Uh, how does that compare with the proportion of mobile receivers influence, um, losing signal from urban canyons and tunnels and the like? No is idea. that the level of loss that's typical? Of I don't know, but what you're, what you're sort of alluding to there is you're saying, what is their target sort of availability yeah. kind of figure, which we, we, we believe to be around like 99%. So yeah. these are, you know, it's not anything. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's not unlike anything. it was 20 years Small. ago with those big canyons. I mean, yeah. GPS is so much better now as it was yeah. 20 years ago. Mm. Time, time's getting on, guys, so I need to just finish, you don't mind, because uh, Graham is sort of looming over me. Yeah, um, yeah so, so this is what we, so this is now information that we're proposing for the next uh, 5A meeting, where we're determined to get this into one of the ITOR deliverables because that's the only way that we can really make any reference to it formally within the ITOR. <coughs> and unfortunately, it's just a shame that it's a little bit late, so it's missed the target for getting into that text for the CPM report going into WRC. But, but as long as we have it in the report in ITOR, then it can be formally referenced and so on, and that's our plan there. And we have a study. If you look at the link on the bottom, you will find we have a paper which has a lot more detail of all the other scenarios we, we considered, like having a broadband a transmitter, uh, a whole range of uh, a repeater station, for example, instead of a, a home station here, uh, and so on. 
but you know, the, the general thing is that the, the numbers are very, very small, and this is what we, we think is our job now really, is to try and really gain as much uh, leverage as we can with these numbers, and this is what we try to socialise wherever we can, in whatever regions, outside of just the study groups, to make sure the, the administrations understand that these are the low numbers, so that when we get a solution, you know, it is, to use the word we use a lot, proportionate, really, to the scale of the problem. Because for some people, they want to make the problem seem very big, and they continually do that. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we are. Anyway, I, I think I'll finish there, because time's getting on. Uh, yes, please. But what you haven't mentioned is any data to date of interference by Amazon services to RNSS. So, shall I tell you how many, let's say, live cases there are that I can... One. Two. two. No, one more. And was that set up to prove it? No. Or there's was one. That just there's one. In Italy. What was the nature of that? It was a... Well, it is, it is, it is a, uh, a repeater station operating oh. in 1297. So, uh, near, unfortunately, uh, located... <laughs> 12 kilometers away from the European Commission's Joint Research Center, where they are testing on top of a 25 meter mast their RNSS receivers. They are direct line of sight to this repeater, 12 kilometers away, which is 400 meters above them on the hills in northern Italy. I mean, it couldn't have been worse, could it, really? So there are no real life instances? Uh, there was one in Germany. Uh, where a uh, TV uh, repeater station was causing interference again to the uh, Galileo control station in Oppen something, there's a long German name. Uh, they have a control station there, they were seeing signals from the, uh, and, that, and they thought, what are these? You know, they puzzled over this and it turned out to be this digital TV uh, repeater station. The administration has turned it off and solved the problem, which is what we say. You can solve it nationally. But of course they argue that, well, in the real world, once receivers get out there commercially, you know, users won't know they're being interfered with, how will they know if their service is being degraded, which, which I suppose is kind of a fair point. Um, and that's the problem we have, they can't see when there's an issue. Um, but yeah, very few. But also to be fair, Galileo in this band, E6, hasn't really rolled out fully, it's still in the process of, of being rolled out, so, you know, it could happen. There could be others happening that we don't know about. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Barry. Thank you not only for the talk, but thank you for all the effort that you're putting in. Absolutely. I should say, it is a team of us as well. We have a team of guys in ITR, so we all... Stress right. ourselves over this. But as far as we're concerned, you are it. Thank you you, you, you draw the pictures. <laughs>